was in graduate school, uh, among students, there was always that question, can we call ourselves an artist to really claim that, and that somehow that was not something that you did lightly. I learned really early on that to be the best artist that I could be, I had to be true to the authenticity of my own life. I knew that I had to be a whole person to be the best artist I could be. I remember growing up as a child, it was something I always did, and you know, in some form I was doing something creative, and I loved it. it just, you know, I loved it. In my experience, I grew up, luckily, with a lot of professional women doing things in the world, and in that generation, that was something. In the 40s and 50s, they were claiming their passion to, to, you know, to use their gifts in the world in some specific way that was sort of outside of the general zeitgeist of what a woman's work was. Um, not just as adjuncts to either husbands or whatever. I mean, I, my aunt was a biochemist and my mother was a, a doctor. I know my mother, uh, too, gave me so much but she, because she claimed, she claimed her whole person. You know, she claimed herself as a as a woman, mm -hmm. as a mother, as a wife, and as a doctor. And she was not, you know, she didn't feel like she had to give up one to do the other. My father grew up with, with his, his sister, his eldest sister, you know, being his powerhouse. And so he was very, always very supportive and open to that. And of course, he married my mother, who was brilliant and was a doctor. So he never had a problem with and, um, and that was a great benefit for me because I just saw that that was just part of my milieu growing up, you know, with these strong women who were also warm and nurturing and wonderful, but very present in their own life. So I grew up with that kind of freedom and belief, but no pressure to become a doctor or to become anything specific, but just this sense that that, that was just part of my birthright as a human being. My undergraduate degree was from Agnes Scott and it was in psychology. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of art because it was one of the things I was always very passionate about. I remember in graduate school when I did finally go back, I was out of school uh, for a while. I got married. Um, and uh, went to Germany and lived because my, my husband was in the service, you know, was in the army, and we went to Germany. It was great. You know, I was barely 21, just 21 when I moved to Germany for two years, and that was, that was a great experience. At that time, I had, you know, I, I took a, a break from college to, to go to Germany, and then when I came back, I finished at Ava Scott. Um, a year and a half later than I would have graduated. Um, so that was that was a whole, you know, other part of my life that was very rich. And um, and I really wanted a child. And it wasn't actually until after I gave birth to my son that I became, you know, that I just really knew that art that I wanted to be an artist. And it was, it was just this, this push inside of me. It's the only way I can describe it. I mean, I didn't have, a, I had words for it, but I didn't really know the full breadth of it. You know, I just knew that I had to follow it and trust it. And because otherwise I would just be miserable and make everybody around me miserable. You know, it was just sort of that kind of decision. <laughs> so um, at that time, when I went to, to Agnes Scott, ceramics, you know, working with clay was the only three-dimensional option because the, it was a very small department. Mm -hmm. There really was not, not any work with wood or stone or any, anything other than there was drawing and painting and there was pottery. 
you know, or not just pottery. We did hand-built sculptural, you know, relief things too. But the teacher was a potter. So, and clay, I just responded to, you know, the material. It was the materiality of it and the possibilities of it. I just, I loved working with it. So, when I was living, uh, also I lived in Syracuse for a couple of years. Um, my husband took a job there and we moved there and that was that was great so I took a couple of classes at Syracuse University while I was there just because I was interested in one of them was in you know ceramics because that was had been my my material that I was the most familiar with that I loved and so when I came when we moved back to Georgia um, and I had decided that very much that I wanted to I, I had taken the GREs because I knew I wanted to, to go on, but I didn't need, really know exactly what or how or mm -hmm. how that was going to work out. But then um, I started looking at into into the schools around the Atlanta area that were that had ceramic programs. And at that time, Georgia State. I mean, this was in 1970, mm -hmm. 70, between 70, 71, 72, 73. You know, around that time. Uh, 74. So I was I was out of school quite a while before I, I decided to go back to graduate school. And my son was still young, and so Georgia State would have made the most sense. But the department at that time was very limited. There was just mm -hmm. a potter there, and I was, I knew enough to know that because I had been working with clay, I had my own wheel and my own, and, and I just tried to become a potter. But I think there's a certain mindset about making, you know, making like a set of dinnerware, which, you know, I honor deeply. I mean, one of my dearest friends is, is a fabulous studio potter, and she makes amazing things. But what I would do is I'd try to do these things, and I'd end up with wanting to make these one-of-a-kind things. I mean, I just, my mindset was not, I just was not set up that way. <laughs> so I, um, you know, went to some some workshops at Penland for, in the summer, um, and right before I went to, to to school. And so so to make a long story short, I was looking at programs, the MFAs in in ceramics, because that was where my experience was. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, somehow I met a couple of people that were teaching in the program at the University of Georgia. Um, Jerry Chappelle and Ron Myers. And, um, you know, uh, Jerry Chappelle particularly, I talked to him at some conference, play conference or something, and, and I could tell that he was really open to what, you know, whatever I might be interested in doing in clay that was not just pottery. And, and I realized that the program at the University of Georgia was, at that point, really superior in play. And so I just decided that I was going to apply to the University of Georgia and I was going to commute from Atlanta every day because my son was five and I didn't want to be away from him. But my husband had, a, a, had an aunt who lived in, in Athens and, and had a big house uh, one of those wonderful old houses in Athens, and she rented out rooms to students. She didn't have any students in there now, but she had a lot of space in her house. So I would spend one night a week there so that I could get up early and be there and also have some of the sort of community sense of being there in the evenings and go out and have beers and, you know, meal with friends in the, in the program and have a little feel of, of being there. So, so I started, and I mean, it changed my life. It really did because, you know, I I just needed that. I needed that focus. I needed that sort of support because my undergraduate degree. I mean, I did. I hadn't really had training per se in art, mm -hmm. and so I had great professors. You know. All the, all the way around. I did have an interesting inter, interchange with one of the very erudite 
professors that he was British and he was teaching these seminar classes and I was in one of his classes, I can't remember now even what the title was, but I remember going to his office to speak with him about a, a paper I was writing or something. And um, <laughs> he said to me, and he was also sort of a Jungian, so his, his, all his theories about art were sort of based on the way he, his own reading of Jungian uh, psychology, mm -hmm. philosophy. So he, he said to me just off the, off the bat, and, and just an aside, he had had a young wife who had been a student of his, and you know, she was an adoring, you know, accolade for a while, but then, you know, she wanted, she was in, asserting her own person and independence in the relationship, and so he was having, I knew that through the grapevine, you know, he was um, in the midst of, of, of this, um, but he said to me, well, you know, um, this was in 75 or 76, maybe, he said, you know, they really can, women can never really be great artists. You know, only men can be. And I was just aghast, you know, I was aghast and he was sitting here and saying this to me. And I said, well, I don't understand why you say that. Well, just look at history was when I said, well, that, you know, that, that, that means nothing because very few women artists have been, you know, you know there, there are a lot of reasons for that and we discussed that. But I, he said, well, he said the real reason is because uh, a man has an anima and that's, that is his, that's what drives his creativity and a woman can have a child and she just has an animus, and she can have children, so she doesn't have the drive to create because she can have children, and men can't have children. That's why. And I just looked at him, and I said, "You know, I just I don't understand why you why you see it that way." I said, "Number one, a woman at at her core is an anima. <laughs> you know, the whole point of." being feminine is that your core is this creative being in terms of Jung. You know, if you look at it through Jung's lenses. And I said, second of all, you know, you can't say that to me. Here I am. I, ha I am a mother and I, I, I love my son and he's really a central part of my life, but I am driving back and forth, you know, a hundred and, you know, whatever it is, 70 miles both ways all week long because this is important to me because I have a strong drive to become an artist. You know, it's not one or the other. And he just looked at me, and, you know, when I said, well, a woman is an anima at her core, he just looked at me like, oh, you know, I never thought of that that way. I may use that. <laughs> That's what he said to me. I was just, I was like stunned because it was the first time that I had actually come up against that kind of um, male kind of, twi you know, looking at reality through a lens that excluded women. Uh, you know, it wasn't just, well, some women are good and some women are bad, but just totally all women are not, it's just not possible. I mean, no one had ever said anything like that. Of course, he would never say that in a classroom, but sitting in his office, he said it. But that was really an astounding kind of revelation to me. You know, he was this very erudite who, and a man who seemed really open and intelligent, extremely intelligent. And, and I realized intelligence is no uh, inoculation against, against prejudice or, you know, stupidity, really. Because when someone wants to believe something, they will twist whatever they hear to align with what they want to believe and confirm their beliefs. We know, we know that, right? yeah. we see that in so many different ways, which I'm not gonna digress into right now. But anyway, um, that, that's kind of an interesting part of my history. So in, in by the, then the second year that I was there, Andy Nassis came to teach. He came from Chicago. He was in, teaching in Chicago and 
he came down and he took um, he took Jerry Chappelle's place because Jerry Chappelle decided to you know I can't remember the exact thing but he left and Jerry had had been the person that because because when I first started I really wanted to start printing images I wanted to I had taken a workshop with Eric Grunberg who is a a ceramicist who printed decals on his work and cast plaster um, uh, objects, uh, hands or other objects, and combined them with with hand built and thrown forms. And, and it was really, I did a workshop at Penland with him the, the summer um, after my first year at Georgia. And um, or, or no, maybe it was right before I started. It was before I started going. It was the summer right before I started at Georgia. So I came really wanting to. I had learned something about it, but I, I, I came wanting to learn the how to do the the dark room, the copy camera kinds of things that would allow me to burn silk to silk screen the images so that I could make my own ceramic decals, basically. So, uh, and Jerry, that's what he was great. He said, I'll set you up with, you know, the photography guy was real uptight and he wouldn't, he wouldn't cross, he wouldn't go cross discipline with, with anybody, you know, any graduate students. But he knew that the graphic design department, he, he was friends with the head of that. And so he got me a graduate student who worked with me. And so I learned, you know, just it was like the world opened up because I learned how to use the copy camera and I began using, uh, doing a lot of autobiographic things, using pictures of my grandparents, my grandmothers primarily, and, um, and, and my father, and um, then making ceramic decals and, and, and combining those with other kinds of decals. So that, that's kind of what I did. The, first year, but then I, I really got interested in, I wanted the image to be directly on the clay so I could move into it and stretch it and cut through it. And so I began just printing directly with underglazes directly on the clay and um, then combining those with other materials. And I'll never forget one, one of my uh, crits with, um, with Andy and uh, Ron Myers, and Ron Myers is a, is a fabulous potter, and he was a great teacher, and he's a great friend. And, and he said to me, he's, because this, this first crit, when I was starting to combine these found objects with these surroundings, and, and you know, in the beginning, things don't really, you know, when you're in the beginning of some new idea, oftentimes it's very awkward. And as Andy Nassi said very wisely, he said, you know, when you see a new, um, a, a new, new plant, just the little seed pod coming out, sometimes you can't you can't tell what it's going to be, and it looks kind of awkward. He said, "But, but this is exciting and fresh stuff. You know, keep doing it." And Ron said, "You're going to start. You're going to move into other materials. I know that. I can see that. Why don't you just do it?" <laughs> And I just, you know, I didn't know any of that at that time. I didn't know where it was going. But I knew that I had to, I, I learned very early. And I think that one of the great gifts of the University of Georgia program was that the, the professors didn't try to impose on you their own style, so their own ideas. Come on, you want to come up here? Their own, they didn't try to impose their own styles onto the students, and so that there was no, and and there wasn't this strong kind of competition between the students for, you know, primacy with the professors or whatever. There was just this this real community sense of helping each other and being honest with each other about the work as we had, as we discussed what we were doing. And, and that, that was a great bound, I think. Because I didn't feel um, any pressure uh, 
you know, I felt support for my own explorations. I got my, ma my, my MFA in ceramics, and, um, and by the time I left, I was making constructions with other materials. And um, it allowed me then also, I love teaching, I taught at the Atlanta College of Art as an adjunct for many years. I guess in, by the time, I, I left Georgia in 77. 79, I went to, on the Cortona program as an artisan resident. And that was a great experience. And while I was there, I decided that instead of making anything that I had to ship back, which was expensive, that I would just make something that then I could, you know, destroy at the end and it would just be an experimental thing. And so I began just doing installations there. And and then, you know, I had a bonfire and burned them at the end. <laughs> but it was it was very freeing. And when I came back, I did an, an installation in a show that uh, John Howitt curated at the High Museum, the uh, 12 avant-garde in Atlanta. So I, that started me. I think that that opened the field for me. I mean, I began then being interested in, I did a piece at the old, in the old Nexus building. I, I cut through a wall. It was an old lath wall. I did this, and I started using saws. I ended up with circular saws, and I was going up and down these tall ladders with these circular saws, cutting into the wall. And it just, it, 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 it was kind of endemic of the future, which was when there was something I really was passionate about learning how to do, I would find someone who knew how to do it, and I'd learn. And so school is a great beginning, but I think that pattern of learning and exploring continually as an artist and as a human being is, is really kind of our birthright. It's something that is at the ground of what I, the way I make art, and that is uh, a concern for respecting and sort of a humility in the face of all the things I don't know. Nine, in 1990 and 91, I went back to Georgia Tech and studied architecture when um, I had done a couple of large-scale installations uh, in, in Piedmont Park, actually, the Piedmont Park Arts Festival. At some point, I just realized that I wanted to work large and I wanted to work, I wanted to do public work, you know, work out in public spaces. And it was so, it was so great. I mean, you know, I'd been teaching for a long time by that time. And so here I was, a student again. It was, it was, it was great. It was really challenging and interesting, you know. For a while, I get I at that time, you know, I just I really love um, I love uh, intellectual stimulation, <laughs> and it was very stimulating. Andy Nassis particularly was was a, the, a great mentor for me at that point because he had come from Chicago and he had a, a broader art context that his own work was coming from. And so he would say, go read about Michelle Stewart or, or go read about Eva Hess or, you know, he was giving me these women artists who were really on the cutting edge of what they were doing at that time. And I was, and I was reading about Robert Rauschenberg and uh, and Elaine de Kooning was at Georgia at that time. She was like an art visiting artist, and I was in her seminar, and that was great, you know. But I remember at some point she said something in her, you know, one of her talks, because of her experience with William de Kooning, you know, well, you know, you can't, if you're going to, you can't um, be married, um, I can't remember exactly what it was. it was, but it was just sort of another one of these ideas that if you're going to make your own way as an artist, you can't 
you know, be with a, with, a, with, a, with a man or you can't be in a relationship because then that's going to pull you off. And of course, that happens to a lot of women, I think, do have that, that, those issues because we're pulled between the things that are important to us. But again, I had this great role model in my own mother who never felt like she had to choose, and she didn't. And she did both extremely well. I was talking to Andy Nassis about what Elaine de Kooning has said and, you know, how that had really, you know, I just hadn't, didn't agree with it, but it also kind of made me think and, and made me worry about my own choices. And he said, well, you know, if you belong to that club, then you have to pay the dues. And I thought that was such a great way of talking about how, you know, this mental construct of what you have to do, what, you know, how, what lines you have to toe to become successful. Another aspect that comes in about sometime in the early 80s was uh, discussion groups with physicist David Finkelstein and other artists and other writers and poets um, that began sort of um, in at, at a group of a class at Emory that I happened to be invited to, which was great, um, through friends, through Catherine Mitchell actually, who who knew all these other people and the 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 wonderful composer Dick Robinson and those people. So we began meeting and talking about the new physics, you know, contemporary physics, which I was already interested in because when I was at graduate school at Georgia, I had begun reading. One of my classes led me, you know, some paper I wrote was sort of about, about the turn of the century and Duchamp and sort of comparing how ideas in different fields are opening new ways of seeing and sometimes they're a tandem and they kind of cross fertilize. And so I began reading, that time I was reading about, you know, that was when quantum mechanics and, you know, first Einstein and then Niels Bohr and all those people were working in the, in the way reality was seen, the old classical way of understanding reality was sort of opened up. Not to say that that you know momentum and all those things aren't true in a particular context, but the context expanded, and so that was just so stimulating to me. So I, you know, I guess that I I grew up really being interested in biology and sciences. I've always been interested in that, just as a stimulating, thought-provoking thing. And I loved, I think Agnes Scott was such a fabulous ground for my life as an artist because a liberal arts ed education, you know, I took fabulous, had a fabulous anthropology class. I, you know, wonderful liter study of literature and uh, great aesthetics class and, um, you know, biology and just the understanding that as a human being, you know, there's this large field of, of ways as, as human beings we try to understand the world that we are a part of. And in fact, the piece that I did on the campus of Agnes Scott in front of Dana is really about that, that myriad exploration, the, the sandblasted images and text in the pavers are about that liberal arts endeavor and a sort of a celebration of that. But in the end, you know, the, as, we, as we go forward, I mean, right now, physicists like uh, cosmologists like David Finkelstein, he, he says, he says when he was a young physicist, he was sure that, 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 that the universe was understandable, that there would be a time when we could explain, you know, everything could be known and understood, and uh, there would be a theory of everything, basically. And he said now he understands that that's totally an impossibility because of the nature of reality, because it is at its core 
you can't, you can't fix it, all the parts long enough to measure them and to understand it's so complex and it's, it's so dynamic. And, and I love it. You know, I love think, trying to think about that. And I think that, you know, our ideas about our lives, I mean, you know, it, you can think about it in terms of the big universe, but each one of us is like a particular part of that whole that is unknowable at its core because it's grounded in the foundation of, of the whole. We're connected into it, even though, our, you know, the way we think about ourselves in reality is that somehow we're discreet and, you know, everything that human beings do is this one thing and then there's nature out there and then there's, you know, this larger reality, but somehow we can poke out and touch it and move it around and we know that it affects us, but we, we just don't really have that, con we haven't developed yet that consciousness of how connected we are to the whole. And I think that, that in my work, one of the things that I, that I hope to do, that I strive to do for myself first is to continually open myself to all the, the depth and the connection and the interconnection and the wonder of it. Because to me, the, at the core, you know, as human beings, our, our, we're the one species that we know of on this planet. I mean, there may be, may be the whales, maybe there are others that have their own way of celebrating in a conscious way the vastness of it and the mystery of it. But to me, it's like, as human beings, the more we are open to what all, to the value of it all, um, you know, because at the, at the core, really, of, of any um, thinking about, you know, I hate the term spiritual, and a lot of times people define my work as spiritual. They use that term. And not that I hate it, but I think that it, it has become this code that limits the way people think about my work or the field of spirituality or religion or whatever. I mean, it's sort of like, oh, it's this thing and it's over there. And in a way, it's kind of, it can also be pejorative. Um, and I think that, that really, you know, and there was, there's this, this new book out by a biologist and he's talking about the new spirituality and he's just talking about value. And then I think um, the base of, of all religion really is a valuing, a deep honoring and valuing of the whole of reality. And, and at the core, that's what it's about. And, and I think that if we base our lives and our work on, on that, on that thing of valuing it, you know, it's a mystery. We don't know the source. We can't, you know, we can have a lot of ideas about it and a lot of um, constructs that are beautiful. And, you know, I think myth is myth is, and art, as they say, about art is the lie that tells the truth. It's like there's a truth there, but it's, it's not, you can't, put your finger on it and say in our language or in any kind of language absolutely this is what it is because the minute you do that you falsify it because it's larger than any way that we can name it but I I feel really drawn and in a sense you know vocation in the deepest sense is a calling to give voice to that truth that I feel about reality. And so to me, when, when I'm, you know, open to the world in a way that I've experienced it, and, and I see that, and to me it's a deep beauty. And it's beauty not in the sense of some sort of formulaic, 
pretty saccharine, sentimental thing, which to me is not beauty. But it's like a place where all the opposites and all the chaos and, you know, destructive forces and creative forces are all like they're cohering. And it's, it's this, you know, art that touches us deeply has that kind of, it's like awesome or this part of, you know, in touch with the sublime. And it, at its core, I mean, that, that's what, what my work as, a, as an artist in my studio and my work as an artist, um, a public artist, try to reveal something about the life of the place that the work is that opens people to, to myself first, of course, because that's what I'm interested in is discovering sort of some hidden wonder or beauty or essence that is an essence not in a fixed way, but as an alive dynamic thing that's below the surface, that's unseen, the unseen life of a place that then when people hopefully can see it, even if it's for a split second, it connects with the place in themselves that, that then they are more aware in their own lives, even for a moment, of where, they, where they're standing. And it's, it's, a, it's like, you know, it's what I want for my own life, and it's a struggle. I mean, you know, self-knowledge is a struggle. It's a daily thing of being honest with yourself and looking deeply at where you are and what you've said and what you've done and in, in being honest about it. I have had a really deep interest in ecological issues for a long time, although it doesn't surface in my work in a, in a real uh, overt way. I went to a, to a, a, a conference in Boston about water, use of water in artwork, you know, because I was interested in that, in doing work with water. And there was this biologist that spoke. He was working with these, this process he called living machines that would purify water through just ecologically natural means by going through tanks first with fish would eat certain organisms and then there would be microorganisms that would break down other things and then it would be filtered more and more until the water was usable at the other end. And I was I and the thing that fascinated me about it was his philosophy was that the natural world is all is dynamic, and it's always trying to, you know, come to some sort of balanced thing, and it's some kind of. And in our minds, we would say, you know, if it gets really out of whack, it wants to heal itself, in a sense, and that we, that we can cooperate with that by using things that are in the environment already. And he did have some test things, some really amazing things that he did with ponds like, you know, a bog that was a cranberry bog or whatever in Maine that was polluted because it was near this, this um, landfill that was seeping into it. And he put one of these living machines that were solar powered floating around the pond and so the, the, uh, these, the circulating water um, elements were down in the pond, and that he he was just, they were amazed that how quickly it even though there was that continual seepage that the pond became habitable again and and healthy. You know, naturally, because of just maybe my nature or whatever, I. I was always, you know, I'm always open to where an idea leads me. And so the ideas aren't connected to just a particular process of working, technique, or material. So that I was open to what materials I might need to explore the ideas and the, 
the conceptual frame that was important to me. So as I began doing large-scale installations and um, I, I began using other materials. I have used so-called natural materials or materials that are in the un from the unbuilt world in a way, but they're also touched by technology. But, you know, I did do that piece for the Olympics that was from airplane parts, mm -hmm. which I also find, um, you know, to me, you know, in the larger sense, you could also think, since human beings are a part of nature, I mean, we're not outside of nature. And I think that that's one of the reasons that, that for many people, going out into the larger natural, so-called natural environment is so refreshing. Because when we're just in a, a built environment by human content that comes out of our own human consciousness, it can be very, um, we're just ricocheting off back and forth against our own limited ideas, and there's something about the plenitude out there of diverse, diversity of form and that's continually alive and changing that's very invigorating. I, I enjoy doing both, like for instance with the airplane parts. One of the things that I enjoyed was taking a built a thing that was already constructed for another use. You know, there were parts of air of big airplanes, and then seeing, finding the mystery in them. You know, it's like you look at them and you knew what they were, but then they were also something else. So that you know, cutting them and revealing that the fact that they were engineered for a different thing, and the sh if you look subtly, the shapes of those horizontal stabilizers that I cut up, they have this wonderful elliptical, and then the inside structure all was part of this engineered mathematical uh, use, uh, its previous use. And so, in a way, I was revealing some hidden, what I felt was some sort of hidden um, life in them by taking them and reusing them so that they became this playful kind of, these playful forms. And the, a certain kind of beauty that was beyond their utility was revealed, I think, on the surfaces, the forms. And so that was fun and playful for me. And I think that that, again, it's like re-experiencing what what's in our everyday awareness and, and that we interact and we're moving and we're not really looking at things a lot of times. We're just, you know, you fly in an airplane, you might see one out on the runway, but when you're getting on, you know, the, the, the chute that we walk through is connected. You see about that much up close of those rivets and that's it. It's utility. You're getting in that thing and it's taking you someplace. You very rarely look at it as an object of beauty or as a form or as it, you know, sort of you don't look beyond just that, that surface relationship that you have with it. So I enjoy doing that with found materials that are made, you know, or part of something. I've, I've done works that I think Mocha has a small work of mine that is just, you know, came from a, a big auger that part of it did, and, you know, a big squashed pipe. But, you know, you don't, when they're put together in that way, you don't see their original history so much. And I like that. I like playing with that. But in terms of materials, in, natural materials, my, my love with stone really kind of began, I would say, in the 90s. And the Agnes Scott piece was actually the first time I used stone in, in, a, in a piece. Um, and the, you know, I, I didn't work it at that point. I mean, I, the, the tiles I did sandblast the images in, but I had not started 
forming, doing any kind of carving or shaping of the stone. But I was using them as seating elements and also for the quality of the stone in the, in the piece. And so, again, it was that part of the thing about using these naturally occurring things is to evoke tactile bodily awareness when you're in the space of the, of the work. And, you know, when I was doing the show at MOCA, I was reading a, an, archi an architectural, you know, book, a book about uh, um, haptic, it was talking about haptic sense. And, and the, what a haptic sense is, is uh, as human beings, we have this ability to project our bodies outside of the, the physical limits of our skin. For instance, when you drive a car, and it's the car that you drive every day, you, you don't have to think about where the wheels are, where the, the front edge or the side edge, I mean, you just know because you have expanded into the size of that car, and you don't have to think about doing it because you've extended your hands, you know, your body it becomes part of that car. Well, I think that artists, when, when they're really invested in their work and they're connected to what they're doing, in a sense that developing work becomes an extension of their bodies in some sort of psychic way. You know, psychologically, we are pro we projected our sense of being into what we're doing, and oftentimes when I'm working, and and I have to say that I really don't believe that when we're working that there's one right and final perfect solution to a creative work. I think there are myriad possibilities, um, but I think that we can have, we have a sense as we're going if something's working or it's not working. And I honestly feel it in my body. When something's off, in my estimation, I mean, somebody else might not agree with it, but from, from, from my own lights, if something's not right, I just, it's like a physical sensation in my body. There was something about the nature of granite that just I wanted, I wanted it. <laughs> That's all I could, uh, you know. And and I knew it was insane. Granite is so hard. It's hard to work. It's heavy. I mean, you know, it's not it's not sort of practical that I would do that. Soapstone is, you know, lovely. I mean, it's easy to work. It's you know, there are a lot of things that are easier to work than granite, but. That's what I had to do. I mean, I just, there was something about the nature of the granite. Also, I think this, that it, it's so old and it's so geologically, it's the geological ground, you know, it's like the mantle is the bedrock of, of the, the, the upper skin of the earth is granite for the most part. And um, there's something uh, that is so timeless about it, that's so, it's such an expanded time frame about it, so that when, when it's there, it brings all that, you know, span of geological time into the work. I think that's part of what, what I love about it. Um, and then being a part of that library, Project, which was a lead, you know, leader in environmental design. Uh, it, it received a gold certificate, which was really great. Um, it was that was a great experience. Um, but I think that the granite, uh, you know, that ge the the whole geological. Uh, the idea of being aware of the geological ground on which we live um, is is one of the 
one of the points right now that I'm, it's kind of an edge, you know, of where I'm, I'm thinking. I don't know how that's going to play out in my work. The new historic Fourth Ward Park is the Clear Creek Reservoir Project. And uh, that was really so much fun and interesting and challenging to be a part of because I was called, I was hired um, by the Beltline in the city of Atlanta to be a part of the design team when they were when they were designing the park. And HDR, the, the firm that landscape architects and engineers, of course, did the design for the park because it, it was hydrology, you know, based and, and but uh, you know the plan was pretty much set when I came on board but the details of how it was going to be articulated had the ground they had two water features and a plaza and they had a lot of other things and they asked me to see places that I felt that my work and my input could have some impact and you know I think I had an impact generally because of the use of granite the the, the, the large scale elements of granite, I think, are, are great for the overall sense of the park, just design-wise. I was interested in the, in the large pieces of more natural pieces of granite because they're all the, the cut stone granite walls, which are beautiful, but there's so much of it that, that the larger scale pieces are great for just sort of a refreshing balance to, to all of the, the pattern of the walls. Um, but I think that that granite, for me, I, and I've, I've sort of come to this after seeing it, you know, that I think part of why I was so drawn to using the, the, that, the granite is because the, the water, you know, I was, I, I was reading a lot about water and the water cycle you know, the planet war cycle, the rock cycle, these, these, these big, large geological elements of our, of our planet. And the force of water has so much force. And, and the, those, the, it, we don't really, you know, we think we've tamed it. You know, we think we've tamed it. We don't really think about water, the fact that there's all the water there's ever going to be, and it's circulated from the beginning of time. It's in the atmosphere, and most of it is tied up either in ice, underground, or in the oceans. There's a very small, less than 1% of all the water on the planet is fresh water. And, you know, just the power of water and the, the wonder of that, that we have, and, and, and how much our lives depend on it on so many levels mm -hmm. and we just sort of you know we take it for granted in a way which in a way we can because it, it's part of our environment but we ha you know we have the this ability to, to really make you know ruin the source of our life and I think that this is a very small this project is a very small step but a great step in the right direction of at least managing it in a, you know, being stewards of it in some sort of a responsible way by capturing it, aerating it, filtering out all the junk that's on the streets, and then letting it into the river in a slow, measured way instead of just pouring, dumping all that rain, storm water into the rivers, in the creeks. When I did the park, I was thinking about that larger idea of all those forces. And I think that the granite that, that's cut and some of the other, those other elements, that one quarry in, in Elberton that, that I really enjoy the stone from, mm -hmm. because it has those stones that show, it, it's, it's almost like the f frozen molten stone when it was forming, you can see the movement in it a lot more 
in a more pronounced way than you can say in the stones and wall. <coughs> and um, and so I like having that there. It's like, hey, remember, you know, remember what we, you know, where we come from, you know, what we're a part of, and uh, how old it is compared to our lifespan. The project in Charlotte, it's a a um, light rail station and it's all outdoors and the station that that I have uh, that I'm working on it has a pocket park about an acre park in front of it you know I have windscreens I have the, the these supports that support the canopy and I have uh, the paving on the station uh, platforms and um, so I'm early in the design process so I haven't gotten to the point where where the rubbers hit, hit the road yet on that the nature of the public art projects are that they come and you know you send out a lot of qualifications for proposals and then or people call you or whatever, and then people's schedules change, things are put off or elongated, whatever. And so sometimes, even though you try to plan your time, all of a sudden you've got this lump of things <laughs> to, to do all at once. And so the last three years, I would say, have been, well, since 07, really, have been pretty intense in, in terms of that. And, and you know, it's it's fun and challenging in one way, and I hire part-time people to help me, you know, keep up with all of it. But um, right now I'm in a period where I have this one project and some other smaller things that I'm doing and some other possibilities. And I'm, I'm doing some pieces in my studio at the same time out in the country, you know, starting some some small studies and some bigger pieces too. The Mocha show, which was so fertile for me, I mean, really, um, you know, I can't say enough about how important that opportunity and doing that work was for my work in general. But besides that, um, I'd say for the last six or seven years, I've, I've focused on developing my public art practice because I felt like I was teaching and I was I was so sort of dispersed it was really hard for me to to you know get traction and and I knew that if I was going to have enough projects under my belt to then be able to choose the ones that I really was excited about you know to have more opportunities that I just needed to focus on so I guess in maybe 04, 05, I decided that that's what I was going to do. And all of a sudden, I began to get shortlisted on these projects all over the place. You know, I was going to Ireland, and I was going here and there and there. And it, then it's harder after you get, you know, you're in the top five, but then the hard thing for me is coming up with an idea and developing it enough in the month, three or four weeks, or maybe six weeks that they give you, when I have other things, other deadlines too that I'm working on, for me, my work develops over time. I mean, I like taking time for things to, to have depth and, and get, become a little more rich, you know, a little more richness than you can just, the first thing that's on your mind, you, you know, you can do it. But, and also the other thing is, is that I don't tend to have a look about my work. I mean, I, I, one of the part of the things that's interesting to me about working um, in the public realm is that you have this sight in this alive place in the world that exists that then you're going into and developing a relationship with. And you're developing a relationship, it might be too, with a particular community of people who use it um, but that place has its own history and its own, you know, geological history, history of, you know, com the community. Um, 
its own environmental issues, its own built environment issues, and then possibilities for the future. All that is part of that, and it's very hard if you're, if, even if it's a place you're familiar with, to have a deep idea about something that quickly. The, the majority of my public work has been in Atlanta because I've worked with people here and people see the work in person, but they also know that I'm going to be able to pull it off. You know, I'll do it on time, I can do it in budget, I can, because of my history here and they trust that. So it's a kind of a really a slow process of developing that body of work and that ground so that you can move out, you know, into a larger geographical uh, expanse of projects, I think. And uh, I feel like I'm just beginning to be able to do that. When I'm in my studio, I can follow my own you know, whatever uh, things are in, uh, things that interest me, no matter how kind of off the beaten path, mm -hmm. and that's really valuable too because that that sort of blows open the way I'm thinking about everything, and then I can take that back to what I'm doing, you know, out in the world. You know, I, I like doing work that challenges people and doesn't just speak to them on a surface level, but, you know, touches a lot of different places in their experience. Mm -hmm. But I think that my work out in the world has given me a real ability to kind of create a space that, that is compelling and inviting. For people to enter, and for a moment, you know, I thought, oh, maybe I should get a PhD in architecture. But I very quickly realized that that would lead me down a road to teaching or writing or whatever, which I've done some. Of, you know, I've done some of both of those things, but that's not. The, I knew that wasn't the focus or the passion of what I wanted my professional life to be, and so I didn't go that road.